Hi there, today's topic is quadratic quantum speedups. So there are a lot of them, right? You got your Grover's algorithm, there's quantum approximate counting, there's amplitude amplification or estimation, you got your quantum Monte Carlo. So wouldn't it be great if there was just one algorithm that subsumed all of these? Well, that's what I'm gonna tell you about in this presentation. So to kick things off, let's talk about a little bit of randomized programming. Here we are in my favorite programming language, Scratch. Uh, I've written some code here, and we have a block called uh, sample from y, and this is actually some randomized code. If you take a look at it, it does some uh, deterministic stuff, sets some variables, it does this loop 252 times, and inside this loop, it uh, picks some random numbers. So it picks a random number between 1 and 65536 here, that's 16 bits of randomness, and it picks another number between 1 and 65536 here, so that's another 16 bits of randomness. So 32 bits of randomness per loop iteration and does some more deterministic stuff and calculations. And at the end, it sets a variable y to some number. So if we run this code, sample from y, then uh, this y will get set to some real number. And in this case, it was 109.06. I don't know if you can read that if you squint carefully. Uh, OK, if we run it again, take a look at y again, it's 99.25. We can run it again. Take a look at y again, 83.87, run it again, 19, okay, and so forth. So um, one thing we might be interested in is what is the average value of y uh, that's returned by this function? So, well, it seems in the neighborhood of some two-digit number. Uh, one thing we can try to do to test it is compute the empirical average. So I've got some more code over here for that. Uh, so this code over here, when I click it, it's going to do 1,000 trials of running this sample from Y code, and it's going to total them up and divide by N and set this variable mean estimate to the uh, empirical average. So if I click this, it'll take a little while to run, uh, but when it's done, I can check the uh, mean estimate here, and that was 140. Okay, and let's do it one more time just to, I don't know, prove it wasn't a fluke or see if it's reporting relatively consistent answers. So if I click it now, 138.6. Okay, so it's pretty believable that the mean is in the order of around 140. Okay, so more generally, let's say that you have some real random variable y and it's generated by some code called, you know, sample from y. Uh, the question we wanna ask is how many samples are needed to get a good estimate of mu, the mean, or the expectation of this random variable y? Well, uh, actually this is a trick question because the answer is zero. You see, uh, you could just enumerate all the outcomes for y's random numbers, all the random number generation calls it makes, and then, you know, compute the average value that uh, y takes on. Now, there's a problem with this. You know, in the scratch code I showed you, it did 32 bits of randomness per loop iteration, and there were 252 loop iterations. So that's like 8,000 random bits. So, I mean, if sample from y uses 8,000 random bits, then this strategy of enumerating all the possible outcomes, figuring out what y would be given the random bit outcomes and averaging them would take like two to the 8,000 time steps, which is no good. So uh, let's rephrase the question a little bit and say, you know, if our time budget allows for running the code up to order of n times, now how well can we estimate the mean mu of the random variable? And in this scenario, it might be more natural to just uh, try the Monte Carlo method of running it a bunch of times and taking the empirical average. So classically, we don't really know how to beat this uh, output the empirical average method. But what I want to tell you about now is uh, a new quantum algorithm that Robin Kothari and I came up with that speeds this uh, up quadratically. Um, you know, given that we're making a quantum algorithm too, I can also point out that this code that samples from Y uh, can also be quantum code. But for the main part in this presentation, I'll just stick with the simpler scenario where the code generating the random variable Y is uh, classical randomized code. Okay, so uh, we're gonna get to exactly how the mean estimation algorithm works at the very end of this talk. Um, but while I still have your attention, I'm going to spend um, a bunch of time just telling you about our key subroutine. And this key subroutine is the most fun part of the algorithm, and uh, it'll take up the next chunk of our time to describe it. Okay, so what is this new quantum subroutine uh, that's at the heart of our new mean estimation algorithm? Well, it solves a bit of a funny problem, so we have to uh, look at it carefully. The input to our new quantum subroutine is some randomized code, like sample from y that I showed you, as well as a parameter epsilon. 
And there's some promises here. So uh, we're promised that the expected square of the random variable is at most one. Okay, and this is sort of just to sort of set the, set the scale of the problem. You know, if you just get some code sample from y, you don't know anything about it. Maybe it's returning numbers that are around one or two or 10. Maybe it's returning numbers that are like 10 trillion. Maybe it's returning numbers that are like, you know, minus 0 0.001. So the, uh, our subroutine kind of needs to know the, the the scale of the numbers it's talking about. And so we'll assume this promise that the average squared value is at most one. Um, moreover, uh, the subroutine assumes that you're in one of two cases. The mean is either close to zero, or more precisely, let's say at most 0 0.01 epsilon, an absolute value, or it's about epsilon far from zero. So an absolute value, it's you know around epsilon, either between 0.9 epsilon and 1.1 epsilon. Uh, okay, so that's the setup. And uh, the outcome is that our algorithm can decide whether you're in case one or case two, whether the mean is close to zero or epsilon far from zero uh, with high probability in an amount of time that's basically uh, one over epsilon times the time to uh, run the code sample from y. Uh, so this is new. I should point out that like, um, if you knew that y was always between zero and one, for example, then this would not be too hard and you wouldn't need a quantum algorithm for it. Um, but this algorithm works, you know, with y having any values. So the expected square of the values is at most one, but they can still range, you know, they can still be a hundred or like negative a hundred, uh, occasionally. Okay. So this is what I want to talk about for the most of this presentation. And at the end, I'll talk about once you have this quantum subroutine, how you can layer on a bunch of classical ideas, mostly like binary search to get the new quantum speed up for uh, quadratic speed up for general mean estimation. And I'll also mention comparison with previous work in this area. Okay. Uh, in fact, I have to even uh, question whether this is a new uh, subroutine at all, because as I'll tell you just now, it's actually just Grover's algorithm, but with complex phases. And you might think, you know, we have Grover's algorithm for like more than 25 years. Is there anything really new to say about Grover's algorithm? But I contend that there is. So I'll show you our new algorithm, and you can be the judge. OK, so this is a schematic of what the input looks like. It's some randomized code called sample from y, and it's got some lines, and it returns a, a number y at the end. And since it's randomized code, it, it, it makes calls to random number generators. Let's imagine it calls you know, this function random bit that gives it a random bit like 99 times. So this code uses 99 bits of randomness. I should mention, by the way, for the technical uh, the lovers of technicalities. Whenever I talk about code here, I actually mean a, a circuit, not you know an algorithm. So there's no question about it getting into an infinite loop. It runs at a fixed amount of time. Uh, okay, so whenever you have code like that, you can always actually refactor it so it picks all its random numbers right at the beginning, and then it's subsequently deterministic. So I've rearranged this code here so that it picks 99 random bits and puts them into this random variable b, and then it computes some deterministic function little y of the random bits b. Okay, so again, there's you know zillions of possibilities here for the randomness, two to the power of 99 different random outcomes, and so there are potentially two to the 99 different values for this random variable y. So I've written capital N for this enormous number, two to the 99, and this random variable y generated by this code is you know little y of one with probability one over n, little y of two with probability one over n, and so forth. Um, two to the 99 possibilities. The quantity that we're interested in trying to figure out is mu, uh, the mean of this random variable. And since you know all these outcomes are taken with probability one over n equal probability, mu is just the average of these two to the 99 different uh, function values uh, of y. Okay, so if we look at this code, uh, after you you know execute this line, the the variable b holds the uniform probability distribution over the numbers one through n, or I suppose zero through n minus one, but it's it's nicer to call it one through n. And after you run this line, uh, the pair b and y holds the uniform distribution over all uh, possibilities l together with y of l. Okay, so remember we're actually uh, designing a quantum algorithm for trying to figure out the mean of this random variable y, the average of the y values. Uh, so we're going to change this line to actually instead set b to the Hadamard transform or 99 Hadamard gates applied to uh, zero qubits. Okay, and the effect of that is to make it so that now b holds the uniform quantum superposition over the numbers 1 through n. And since we're making a quantum algorithm, we better change this line of code uh, to reversibly classically compute the deterministic function y of b. 
And that's easy. And once we do that, uh, this pair B and Y now holds the uniform quantum superposition over all pairs L and Y of L. Great. And so now uh, we could still have this code, you know, output a random value for Y if we just measure the Y register at this point. Okay. Um, so let's use a little bit more uh, mathematical notation here. So if we do that, then if we write script H for this uh, Hadamard transform, this script H maps the all zeros qubit string to this, the uniform superposition over ket1, ket2, up to ket n. And then uh, this second part of the code can be thought of as a unitary transformation Y that maps L, I guess, together with some scratch space, which is not depicted, into the pair L and Y of L. And the result after we do that is, as I mentioned before, the uniform superposition over all pairs, you know, L and Y of L. Okay. And actually, um, in this presentation, I just want to, you know, give you this example where you have classical code. But as I mentioned, uh, our mean estimation algorithm is going to work even if Y is a quantum circuit. So this can actually be any quantum code whatsoever, and our algorithm will still work. Um, in general, uh, such code, you know, starts at a fixed state, like maybe all zeros, does some unitary circuit, and produces um, some results, and then it measures some register, so it doesn't have to measure anything, it measures some register and outputs a classical number based on that. And so it can have, uh, it can generate any probability distribution and generate any random variable, y. Uh, perhaps it takes on the values y1 through yd with probabilities p1 through pd. And in general, like, you know, the output of the quantum code on some fixed starting state will look like this, square root of p1 times uh, some junk times the real value y1 written down with bits in some register, plus dot 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 plus square root pd times some more junk, potentially, times the real value yd written down in register. And uh, indeed, if you took this state and measured the final register, it would output this random variable y uh, with the correct probabilities. And uh, it's, you know, an important feature of our algorithm that it handles this most general case where there's uh, garbage produced in addition to the desired random variable y. And you can compare this output of the generic quantum code that produces a random variable y with the kind of output we got in the simple case where we just transformed a classical algorithm into uh, a quantum one. And for the, the rest of this presentation, I'm actually just going to go back to the classical case and this simpler looking quantum state. Uh, but I do want to assure you that like, it's almost just uh, to save on words, the algorithm works just the same in the case of quantum code. Okay, but let's go back to that uh, classical code. And um, what we're going to do now is uh, think about how to get at the average mu of these y values. And in order to do that, we'll compare ourselves with uh, the most well-known quantum quadratic speedup, which is Grover's algorithm. So uh, normally Grover's algorithm is presented as being about um, finding a marked item in a database of zeros and ones, like maybe if there's only a single one, how do you find it efficiently? Um, but uh, you can also think about it, and we will think about it, as uh, a simpler problem, like a, a simpler decision task, where you have a, a bunch of real numbers, y1 through y capital N, which are either zero or one, and maybe they're just all zero, this is like there's no unmarked, there's no marked items, or maybe there's exactly one uh, index, L star, where y takes on the value one, and you're just trying to tell the difference between these two cases. You're trying to decide, is there a marked item or are all items unmarked? And this is kind of inter-reducible uh, with the normal version of Grover's algorithm. So we're going to think of a Grover's algorithm like this way instead, because uh, it's more comparable to our mean estimation task. So here, um, the setup is like you have a mean estimation task where A, you're promised that the random variable is Bernoulli. It only takes on the values 0 and 1. And you're just trying to decide, is the mean 0 or is the mean exactly 1 over capital N? OK, so let's remember how Grover does it. So uh, the first thing that Grover does is it takes this um, oracle or database that you know, assigns to each value L some number y L, which is either 0 or 1. And uh, it kind of gets rid of writing that down and just converts it to assign uh, a phase of plus or minus 1. So it, it puts a minus 1 for marked items on ket L, and it puts a plus 1 uh, for unmarked items on ket L. OK, so we'll put that up here. And just remember that this is how the phase operator phi encodes the values 0 and 1. 
And uh, as Grover's algorithm is going along, it's going to um, have a typical quantum state that looks like this. I factored out the square root one over n's, and it'll have some, you know, amplitude, you know, times root n on each of ket1 through ket n, and I've denoted them by x1 through xn, and these are going to change as the algorithm goes along. I'll show you a picture in a moment. Um, so these are real numbers. They're all initially 1. And for example, uh, if you were to apply uh, the phase operator once, and there is a marked item L star, then it um, will flip the associated XL star to minus 1. And in general, I mean, a different way to write the action of the phase operator is that it multiplies the number XL by this phase, negative 1 to the power of YL, so either plus or minus 1. Now, there's another key component of Grover's algorithm. It's the Grover diffusion operator, or the reflection operator. Um, the code for it, if you will, is here. You do an inverse Fourier transform. You reflect through the starting state, all zeros, and you do h again. And that's a simple uh, circuit to implement. And it's not hard to check that it has the following behavior. It changes all the x's. And what it particularly does is it replaces each XL with its reflection through the average of XL. So sort of you compute the average of the X's, and then XL jumps across the average uh, on the number line, the real line. Um, so these are the two operators that Grover's algorithm uses. They both uh, affect the numbers X1 through XN in certain ways. And in some sense, this is basically the algorithm. So you start, you prepare uh, this state, which I'm going to call um, ket one vector, uh, where all the x's are just the number one. And then you repeatedly apply this operator. You do the phase operator, the reflection, the phase operator, the reflection, and so forth. And then you, you stop and measure at some point. But this is the gist of the algorithm. So let me uh, draw a picture for you illustrating how the algorithm works. So uh, here's the real line, horizontal line here. And uh, I'm going to depict uh, the x values, x1 through xn, as colored dots on the real line. Now, uh, they start out all at 1. So if I were to really depict them properly, they'd all be sitting on top of each other here, right at 1. Um, but I wanted to you know, show them more clearly. So I artificially made some of them like slightly higher, slightly lower. So this is a bit bogus. They're actually all supposed to be sitting at 1, but I've just uh, jostled them up and down for the sake of visualization. Uh, in this example, n is 16. And uh, that's why the the, um, the axis goes up to 4 here. Um, because notice that I, I pre-multiplied all of these x's by square root of 1 over 16. That's uh, 1 over 4. So the maximum possible value for an x is 4 in this little picture. So what happens? They all start at 1. And then you do, um, I'm going to depict the case where there's exactly one marked item. So you do the phi operation. So that one marked value jumps down to minus 1. And then you do the reflection through the mean, and that's going to jump it up to around, well, 1, 2, uh, 3. And the rest of the dots will go down a little. So this is what happens, close to 3, I guess. This is what happens after one application of the reflection and rotation operator, or sorry, the reflection and phase operator. And then if we do it again, the marked items value goes up again. If we do it again, the marked items value goes up again. and uh, Actually, this is the point at which you would like to stop and measure. We see we've got the situation where the marked item's amplitude got up to the maximum possible value. And uh, if you know that there's either one marked item or zero marked items, then you know the mean is either zero or you know, 1 over n, and you know an appropriate time to stop. So in the case where the, there's a marked item, you can stop it so that this uh, marked item's amplitude gets to the maximum value. And if there's no marked item, then all the, the dots just stay around 1 for all time. So you can tell the difference. Uh, you might also know that if you, you keep going, then actually things sort of get worse, and um, the amplitudes bounce around. And uh, actually, they just sort of cycle like this if you keep doing uh, reflection and phase forever and ever. OK, so that's a little reminder of how Grover's algorithm works. Now, recall in Grover's algorithm, uh, each of the, the numbers, the y's, are either 0 or 1. So there's a very sensible way to convert these two numbers into um, phases. You just convert them to plus 1 and minus 1. You have two values for y and you know, two values for these uh, phases, plus or minus 1. But um, in the problem I want to tell you about, we're trying to estimate the mean of a general random variable. So these y values can be literally any real number. So how are we going to convert these into phases? Well, you know, uh, Grover's algorithm is a bit funny in the sense that all these amplitudes stay real numbers. But um, 
Actually, nature, quantum mechanics, gives us a continuum of phases, one for each angle on the complex circle. So why not let's go ahead and use them? So indeed, um, we're going to change the uh, phase oracle to what I call the rotation function. And uh, this is going to act similarly, except when you apply this, we're going to make a new uh, operator rotation, which um, maps ket L to a complex phase times ket L. And this complex phase is e to the i phi L for some angle phi of L. And phi of L is going to depend on y L. And I'll, I'll tell you how it's going to depend on y L in just a moment. Um, but let me first point out that, you know, once we introduce this version of the phase oracle, um, these uh, amplitude values, the x's, are going to become complex numbers, not just real numbers. And so for that reason, I'm going to rename them as z, the slightly more befitting letter for a complex number. And uh, before I, again, get back to what a phi is, let me point out that um, we still use the exact same Grover reflection operator, and it has the exact same effect, but interestingly, uh, this reflection through the average that the, the operator does takes place in the complex plane. So you really compute the, the complex average in the complex plane of disease, and uh, the disease get reflected through this average. So I'll draw a picture uh, shortly to illustrate that, but I wanted to point out that uh, although it's the same operator, uh, it has a two-dimensional kind of effect. Okay, now let's go back to this question of how we're going to sort of map real numbers y to phases through angles phi. And uh, the way it's going to work is as follows. I could just tell you like a formula, like in the end, you know, phi of l is, I believe, negative 2 arctan y of l. But I think it's better to think of it in a different fashion. So here I've shown the, the complex plane, and that's the unit circle, and that's the vertical line that passes through the real number 1. And a given value y that we want to convert into a phase or an angle might, I don't know, be this much. It's a height of about 2 or something. And let's plunk down the point there, which is actually 1 plus i times y. And we'll draw the line through that point. And we'll also reflect it down here, so it also shows another line through 1 minus i y. And now I can tell you that the, the phi we're going to associate to this value of y is the clockwise angle from 1 plus i y to 1 minus i y. So whatever that angle is, that's going to be associated phi. So for example, if y happened to be 1, exactly 1, you could check for yourself that the associated phi would be uh, like clockwise 90 degrees. Okay, so again, uh, you know, you could just write down the formula, minus 2 arctan y, but you should instead remember that phi of l is the angle which rotates 1 plus i y l to 1 minus i y of l. Okay, and our new quantum subroutine, which if you remember is about deciding if the mean is near 0 or near epsilon, uh, it otherwise looks like Grover. So we prepare the same state, ket 1 vector, which has all the z's initially 1, and then we repeatedly do the phase operator, which I call rotation, and the reflection, the rotation, reflection, rotation, reflection, and so forth. Then we'll, we'll again stop it at some point. OK, so clearly now is a great time for a picture. So uh, we're going to do an example. Um, we're going to do several examples, in fact. So in this example, uh, we have eight different values. n is just set to eight. And here they all are. Here's y1 through y8, just some numbers. And in my example, these numbers uh, average to 0.2. I've reminded you what the algorithm is down here. So uh, let's take a look at how this algorithm works. So again, here's the complex plane with the unit circle shown and this vertical line through uh, uh, the real number 1. And uh, before we get into displaying the z's, which are actually the, the complex amplitudes that move around during the algorithm, uh, let's talk about the y's and how they define the rotation or phase operator. So let's take, for example, a look at this brown y2, which is plus 1.04. So I've plotted it here. It's just above 1. And let's remember, what is the associated rotational angle? It's actually just a tiny bit above 90 degrees. It's this uh, angle here. So this uh, rotation operator will rotate the the number, the amplitude, the point z2 by this angle, you know, 91 degrees or something. Um, and I'm actually, for the purposes of illustrating this algorithm, I'm only going to draw this uh, brown line here, the 1 through 1 minus y times i, 
uh, because if I draw both lines, the diagram will get too cluttered. So this brown line here is supposed to remind you that um, for this y value, the rotation operator uh, rotates uh, z2 by twice the angle to this brown line. Okay, so uh, for another example, y1 is negative 0.48. And so this blue line here reminds you that um, the, the rotation operator rotates the, the blue point z2 by twice the angle to this blue line. Okay, so uh, as I said, it gets a bit cluttered if you put in all the lines, but we're gonna do it. So here are the eight lines associated to the eight y values, which help you remember what the rotation values are. Okay, and uh, before we get into that, remember what we're ultimately interested in is mu, which is the average of the y values, which is uh, 0.2 in this case. And really the y values are where, uh, they're the negatives of where these colored lines cross this vertical line through one. So these heights here, 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 here are like the y values and mu is sort of the average vertical uh, crossing point through this horizontal line. So it's about 0 0.2. You see the colored lines are like a little bit biased to being in the clockwise of the, the real axis here. Okay. So this is the algorithm again, and it starts out uh, with the state that has all these amplitudes, Z1 through Z8, at 1. And remember, this is 1 in the complex plane, so they're going to show up here. And uh, like in Grover's algorithm, they all start at 1, so like all these 8 points are sitting at 1. And then we're going to start doing this uh, rotation operator, reflection operator, and so forth. So the first step is to apply the rotation operator, and these colored lines are again, helping you remind you how that rotation works. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, when we apply a rotation, the points uh, go to here. So these uh, colored points now are representing um, the z values, z1 through z8. And you can see, for example, they all started at 1, but the, the brown one corresponding to z2 um, you know, got rotated a little bit over 90 degrees and ended up here. And the blue one started out here, the light blue one, it was corresponding to um, z1, and it rotated twice this blue angle and went up here. Um, this pink one I like because it happened to be that the pink line is basically horizontal, so it, it got rotated very slightly clockwise. Okay, so remember, the rotation operator rotates each colored point by twice the angle to its associated colored line. Okay, so that's a uh, rotation. Now the next step of the algorithm is to do reflection, and that's reflecting these colored z's through the center of mass of them. So we better depict that. So I'm always going to depict the average or center of mass of the colored points as a black diamond. So here it is here. This is the center of mass or average of the colored z's. And uh, just like in Grover, we now reflect the colored z's through this center of mass. So let's, before we do that, let's see what's going to happen. So this light blue one, it's going to go through the center of mass and get reflected to around where my mouse cursor is here, down here. Let's check it out. Yeah, it was close. Here's the reflection of the light blue one through the center of mass. I'm actually going to go back now. Um, let's do another one here. Uh, how about this yellow one down here? It'll go up, reflected through the center of mass, and end up somewhere around here, I guess. Well, I got it close. It's up here. Okay, so uh, that's the outcome of ref applying this reflection operator. The new z values or locations are here. Okay, so next, next step, we're going to apply rotation again. So. Let's again take a peek at this. Uh, let's do the pink point here, that's uh, the z. It's a nice one because, remember, it rotates by double the angle to this line, but that's basically nothing. So it should rotate just ever so slightly clockwise. Okay, indeed that happened. Let me go back again. Let's pick a more interesting one. Um, let's see, so let's take the green one. So it's gonna rotate, uh, this green one looks like it's at, I don't know, 25 degrees, so it should rotate two times 25 degrees. That's like 50 degrees clockwise. So here's the green one. It's going to go 50 degrees clockwise. I, I don't know. It'll probably get around here, maybe. Whoa, I got that way off. What happened? Oh, I guess, um, I don't guess I'm visually overestimating. Like, let's see. Maybe this is uh, the green angle, and this is another green angle. Yeah, I guess, I don't know. I was visually overestimating. Let's do one more so I don't uh, seem crazy here. Uh, okay, let's focus on the brown one. Uh, we know this one is like rotating by 90 degrees. So we should go take this one, rotate it by 90 degrees. It should come to like here maybe. Okay, that was pretty close. Anyway, uh, you know, don't go by my eyeballing. I drew these diagrams in maple, so they should be accurate. Uh, okay, 
Now, next up is we're going to apply uh, the reflection operator again. And we do that. They jump like this. So let me go back again. Here's the center of mass. You see that, like, I don't know, this green one will jump a teeny tiny bit across the center of mass to over there. I'll go back again. Um, let's find a distant one. This light blue one, it gets reflected through the center of mass and comes here. Oh, I got that pretty close. Um, OK, and so forth. So I hope you understand uh, what's going on here. We apply rotation, reflection, rotation, reflection. And uh, yeah, the, the values Z, you know, travel along their merry way. So let's watch a, you know, animation of it. I'm going to show you 20 frames um, where I do rotation, reflection, rotation, reflection, 10 times, you know, each, but alternatingly. So here we go. And yeah. So as we do that, you kind of see that the points sort of drifted around in a clockwise fashion. And this is where they ended up after 20 steps. Um, so I want to show some more animations like this, uh, but I'm going to show them a little bit differently. So first of all, uh, in the future, I'm only going to show like 10 times the composite operation. So I'll show you a 10 frame animation. It pretty much just looks the same. It's actually every other frame. And it just uh, you know glues the reflection and the rotation together, as we were showing before in, in Grover. And I'm actually going to do one more uh, little thing here. I just like to add one more visual aid. I put this thin black line always through the center of mass, but orthogonal to it. And I put that in just because the points kind of tend to like track around um, that line orthogonal to the center of mass. So this is uh, what all my animations are going to look like from now on. OK, so this is one example of how the algorithm works in a specific case. And now I just want to show you some more cases to get a feel for what it's doing. So here's a different um, random variable with eight different values. And I've set it up so that the mean value now is negative 0.2. And uh, the way to understand that, I also showed the lines, is that like the average you know, intercept with this vertical line is sort of um, 0.2 in the, the, above the, the axis. OK, you see the lines are a little bit uh, tilted um, counterclockwise from the horizontal axis. And yeah, I'll show you the 10 frame animation of what happens when you do reflection and rotation here. Uh, yeah, that's, that's Mew in this case. Uh, all right, so it looks like this. So kind of similar to before, I'll show you that again. Um, but this time they're kind of, you know, vaguely ambling around the circle in the counterclockwise way. Okay, uh, let's do another example, a third example. This is one where I set up the number so that the average is zero. So again, um, the intercept of the colored lines with this vertical line uh, have average height exactly zero. So let's watch what happens to the points when we do um, the animation now. And yeah, you see they just kind of wobble around, I'll show it again, in the neighborhood of where they start, one. Okay, interesting. Uh, let's do yet another example. Here's some more um, y values. And I set it up so their average is about double this 0.2 value. It's like plus 0.39. Um, so the lines are more you know, in the, the lower right quadrant here. And let's see what happens when we run this. Well, again, they kind of loop around clockwise in this case with the positive mu, and they kind of went around further this time. OK, let's do the opposite thing. Let's take a new example with eight values where the mean is set up to be half of what it was in the 0.2 example. It's 0.1. And we'll run this example. And yeah, again, they kind of wiggle around in a clockwise fashion, but they only sort of go maybe half as far as they did in the 0.2 case. Let's try yet another example. Uh, I've set up this example so the average value is now 0.05. So it's pretty close to balance, but they're a little bit tending into the, the, the clockwise side of the picture. And if we run these tangent frames, yeah, again, they wiggle around and they kind of traveled on average. This is the center of mass again, maybe half as much as they did in the previous one when mu was 0.1. OK, now, uh, I actually have to tell you a sneaky fact that I didn't mention uh, before, which is I showed you a bunch of different examples with different mean values mu, but they actually all had the same expected square. I cooked the numbers so that the average square of the y values was always 0 0.25. OK, so uh, Intuitively, that means like the sort of the vertical dispersion of the cover, colored lines was constant. You know, I never showed you an example where you know the average was 0.2, but like there were some y's that were like 100 and some y's that were like negative 100. Nor did I show you any examples where you know the average was 0.2 and like all the values were 
you know, tightly concentrated around 0.2, like 0.19 and 0.21. That's because they were cooked to have this um, expected square equal to 0.25. So now let me show you some examples where this is no longer the case. So uh, here's a different example with uh, mean mu equal to 0 0.25, um, but the expected square is now 0 0.05, which is, you know, the expected square of y is always more than the square of mu, but here it's just a bit more. So it means the variance is very small. The variance is 0 0.01. And you see like, yeah, indeed the, the colored y lines intercepts with a vertical line are fairly tightly concentrated around height um, 0.2. And what happens when we run the animation here for 10 frames of uh, rotation reflection? Well, again, they travel around uh, clockwise, but you might notice that like they kind of go more nicely. They kind of hang out around the center of average, the center of mass more tightly. Um, conversely, here's an example where again, the mean is 0.2, but the expected value of y squared is one, which is quite a lot larger. And you see the vertical dispersion of the lines is quite a lot larger. So let's run the animation here. And it's a little wilder, you know, it did eventually sort of travel around in a clockwise fashion, but it was a little bit wonkier. Um, and now if I do yet another example where the mean is 0.2, but the expected value of y squared is much bigger still, like plus two. If we run the animation now, it's kind of just crazy. I'll run it again. It's just really wonky. It's hard to really say what it's, what it's doing. So overall, you know, you can kind of tell that things get little wonky if the expected value of y squared is large. But on the other hand, you know, if we do an example where the expected value of y squared is really small, almost as small as it can be, here I did a slightly different value, mean of 0.157, and expected value of y squared is just a bit bigger than the square of that, 0.026. Uh, so the colored lines are really concentrated around their mean. Now if we do an animation, it's really pleasant. You know, the, the colored lines all stay close to the average, and it just zoops around and actually for a funny reason, ends up right almost at negative one. And in fact, let's think about why this is the case. So let me sort of zoom in here. This is like a zoom in in this example. Um, all the points, the colored points start at one, and here's the, the colored lines, which are reflective of the y values, which have average value 0.2. So the average um, intersection point of these colored lines with this vertical black line is a uh, distance 0.2 from the horizontal axis here which also basically means that um, the arc length from the blue point to down here is also about mu. Um, and now let's think about what happens when we run the algorithm for one step. First thing we do is do the rotation operation, which rotates all the points uh, by twice the associated uh, colored angle. But all the colored angles are right here. So it, it basically kind of rotates all the points to sort of two mu along the circle. And uh, the next step is to reflect them all through the center of mass, or the average, but you know, if they're all more or less hanging around here, then the center of mass is also around here, so this reflection doesn't really do too much and leaves them around here. And you can kind of see if we now do another rotation, they'll sort of travel another two mu along the circle or so. And so in this case where the, the y values are tightly concentrated around their mean, it sort of looks like the rotation, and even together with the reflection, just sort of moves the points two mu along the, the circle. And uh, funnily enough, in the example I showed you where the mean is 0.157, two mu is 0.314, which you might recognize as pi over 10. And remember, I'm showing you 10 repetitions of rotation and reflection. And so these points should roughly travel, you know, about pi around the circle. And uh, indeed, that is what happens. That's why they kind of stopped just right here around negative one. Okay, so we've seen a lot of examples of this um, kind of Grover-like algorithm in the complex plane in action. And you would probably now be tempted to make the following conjecture. Um, you should assume that the expected value of y squared is smallish. We saw it kind of got wonky if it was bigger than one. Uh, but then when you start at this quantum state where all the z values are one, it would seem that each application of you know, reflection together with rotation um, rotates, let's just track the black diamond, the, the, uh, the average value of the z's. It seems to rotate it clockwise by around two times mu. Okay, so this is the impression we kind of got of how this algorithm operates. And let me just tell you, that's correct. This is, uh, we'll prove a theorem and I'll, I'll show it shortly. Uh, that basically quantifies this and says it's accurate. Um, great, so, uh, 
Now, you might ask, what were we trying to do again? So let's, let's go all the way back towards the beginning of this uh, talk, where I was trying to tell you about our new quantum subroutine. Remember, it took as input some randomized code called sample from y and a parameter epsilon. Um, it had the assumption that the expected value of y squared is at most 1, so that's good. It's kind of uh, just how our conjecture likes it. And um, it's also promising you that the, the mean, mu, is either close to 0, or it's around epsilon far from zero. It's either plus or minus epsilon-ish up to a factor of like 1.1. And I was trying to tell you that we have a, a new quantum subroutine, this, this Grover with phases, that can tell the difference between these two cases um, basically by using the code um, sample from y about one over epsilon times. And every time we do reflection and rotation, you need to use the code like a few times um, to do the computations. And uh, given that we want to do this, I hope it's sort of clear how to do it, or mostly clear. With the conjecture in hand, it would seem that all we need to do is you know, set this up and do the reflection and rotation operation about pi over 2 epsilon times. And on one hand, if you're in case 1, you know, mu is basically 0. It's like 0.01 epsilon. You know, if you rotate by 2 mu this many times, well, you're still going to be near 0. And so the black diamond is going to be near plus 1s, where they're hanging out all near 1. On the other hand, if mu is uh, pretty close to epsilon, either plus or minus epsilon, then when you rotate by pi over 2 epsilon times, um, and it moves 2 mu each time, then after having done that, you'll have overall moved pi, or ni minus pi, around the circle. And the black diamond should be around minus 1. So basically, if we could just, like, quote unquote, check where the black diamond is after these t operations of reflection and rotation. And remember, t is, uh, or you can see here, t is proportional to 1 over epsilon as desired. Then we'll be able to tell the difference between case 1 and case 2 uh, with high probability as desired. And it's really not too hard to um, test where the black diamond is. So I'll tell you about uh, the Hadamard test. This is a very basic um, operation in quantum computing you might already know about. It's like the babyest possible version of phase estimation. And it's going to help us determine where the black diamond is after we do two applications of rotation and reflection. OK, so uh, oops, we have some funny uh, typo here. Um, let's write a ket final for the uh, state of the algorithm after we take the initial starting state, ket one vector, and apply this reflection and rotation composite operator t times. And um, you know this just means that we have uh, the final z values, which I've denoted z1 final through zn final. And this is the Hadamard test. It applies actually to any unitary, not just uh, the teeth power of reflection times rotation, but I'm applying it uh, in this case. And how does it work? You, have a, you introduce a new control bit, and uh, you put into that control bit an equal superposition of 0 and 1. And then you do the controlled version of this reflection times rotation um, t times. And by the way, this is actually one reason why you need the, the quote unquote code for um, the, the sampler, because you have to build not just the reflection and rotation operator, but you actually have to build the controlled version of the reflection and rotation operators. So um, for those who really want to know, actually all we really need in this algorithm is not the full code, but uh, for the unitary quantum algorithm that generates the random variable with garbage, we need the controlled version of that unitary and the controlled version of the inverse of that unitary. OK, but anyway, we set up this circuit. And we're going to be putting uh, the initial starting state, ket1 vector, in here. And after that, uh, we're going to measure the controlled uh, bit in the plus or minus basis and thereby get out a real number r, which is either plus 1 or minus 1. And so really, I'm just going to show you how the Hadamard test works. Um, it's not specific really to our setup. It's not hard to calculate that after you do this first bit, just before you measure, the state of the whole um, quantum system is uh, this vector, the average of the uh, initial and final states, um, times or tensor times ket plus, and also the difference of the initial and final states divided by 2 times uh, ket minus. OK. And so you see, if um, imagine you're in the situation where like you start with ket one and maybe mu is zero, and when you apply reflection rotation t times, uh, imagine just it's very idealized. It stays right there. All the z's stay right there at one. So ket final is equal to ket one. Then you know this will equal ket one, and this will equal zero, and therefore the readout will always be plus one. On the other hand, imagine a very idealized situation where all the final values of z are at negative 1, like you've exactly gone pi around and you end 
uh, with all the z's at minus one. So ket final is like the negative of ket one. In that case, this piece would cancel out. This piece would be, you know, ket one. All the amplitude would be on ket minus. So when you did the readout, you would always see minus one. So you see in these two idealized cases we're trying to distinguish, you perfectly, uh, you know, distinguish them. R is plus one or minus one in the two cases. Um, in general, you know, in a, the general case, it's very easy to calculate that um, you can figure out the average value of R, the expected value of R, is actually the real part of the inner product between the starting state, ket1, and the final state, ket final. And just think for a minute, what is this inner product between ket1 and ket final? Well, if you look at ket1, it's like the same as this state, except it has all ones here. So when you inner product those together, you pick up these factors of one over n, so that kind of gives you an average. And the one times z final just is, you know, z final. And so you, in the end, get that this uh, inner product between one and ket one and ket final is just the average of the uh, final z values. And so the real part of the average of the final z values, uh, well, this is just the real part of the center of mass at the end of the algorithm, the real part of the black diamond or the horizontal displacement of the black diamond. And that's pretty much what we're interested in. So just to remind you of the picture, um, you know, if the final uh, position of your blue dots, or sorry, your colored dots looked like this, and you did the Hadamard test, um, you get out a readout plus or minus one whose expected value is whatever the horizontal position of this black diamond is, which is about 0.7. So that, I guess would mean it's like 85% of the time it's reading out plus one. So basically, if this black diamond is, you know, around one or around minus one, then you can really tell the difference just by doing this Hadamard test one time or a few times. Okay, and therefore, uh, this sort of completes the, the description of how our new quantum subroutine works. Of course, it relied on this uh, conjecture, which I told you is true. And I'm not going to tell you really too much more about the formalization of this conjecture. It involves the eigenvalues of the reflection times rotation operator. But I'll just show you, uh, you know, this is the, the bit of the paper I snipped out that pretty much gives you the essential argument for how... Um, you know, the analysis goes. So if you just screenshot this or pause and look at it real quick, you too could probably, you know, complete the analysis. Um, if I gave you, I guess, a little bit more, you need to know some of the notation that's used here. So yeah, just screenshot this or pause here. And by studying this, you can uh, work out, I think, the analysis that confirms the conjecture that we use to analyze our, our key algorithm. Okay, so uh, in some sense, that's it. But now I just wanted to tell you sort of the, the final steps. This uh, quantum subroutine is solving a bit of a funny decision problem. Uh, we're now just going to start layering on some basic classical tricks to improve it. So yeah, you can clear your mind of the quantum stuff for now and just think about some basic ideas. So um, one thing you can notice is that the whole algorithm is sort of scale invariant with respect to epsilon. So if you don't have the expected square of y is at most one, but some other constant, then you can divide by that constant or its square root and get the expectation squared at most one. It changes epsilon by the same constant, but that just goes into the constant factor and the running time here. So, yeah, you know, we can be quite flexible about what this, this constant bound is here. Um, what else? So, uh, this algorithm before is about testing whether mu is close to zero or close to epsilon far from zero. But actually, it's easy to upgrade it so that for any given number mu zero that you're interested in, you can test whether the true mean is close to mu zero or epsilon far from mu zero. And how do you do that? Well, it's simple. You know uh, mu zero and you have the randomized code for y, so just replace it with code that forms y minus mu zero. And then do the code for testing if, if this thing is close to zero or epsilon far from zero. So that's nice and easy, and now you can sort of detect if the random variable's mean is close to or far from any particular number. And with that in hand, it's kind of natural that you'll just do a binary search for the actual mean, mu. And I've been a little bit casual here, but basically you do binary search now by varying mu zero, and you start with like a high tolerance, like epsilon one, and then you gradually refine it, a half, a quarter, eighth, et cetera, down to your final target epsilon. And remember to decide between, you know, if the, the mean is around mu zero or epsilon far from it, um, the cost is like one over epsilon. So with this you know, geometrically uh, decreasing schedule of epsilon values, the costs go up geometrically. And so it's, the total cost is really just dominated by the final cost, which is like one over epsilon. So you see by binary searching, you can actually um, estimate the mean mu to within plus or minus epsilon again in time, like one over epsilon times the, the time required to run the sampling code. 
Uh, that's pretty great. Um, let me just change notation. Instead of epsilon, I'll put 1 over n. So we can also say that we estimate the, the mean mu up to plus or minus 1 over n in time that's like order n times the time to sample the code. Uh, what else? OK, so there's another trick where instead of um, having to assume that the expected square of y is at most a constant, you can merely assume that the variance of y is at most a constant. It just means that like, you know, y is sort of varying on the order of plus or minus 1, but like not around 0, around some other mystery value. But uh, Montanaro had a trick for dealing with this. Here's the simple trick. Um, if you just know the variance is bounded by a constant, well, draw one sample, call it m, and that basically is going to be around the mean mu. It'll be within plus or minus a constant of the, the mean with high probability. And then just subtract that value m from y, and that sort of shifts the mean of y to sort of the neighborhood of zero. And uh, that's enough to make the expected square of y at most a constant. OK, and then we can use our you know, previous result to estimate the mean of y up to plus or minus 1 over n. Um, and then just add m back, and we'll get the mean of uh, our original y to plus or minus 1 over n. OK, so that's another nice trick. Um, to say that the variance is at most 1 is to say that the standard deviation of y is at most 1. So let's put that in there, because we like the standard deviation better. And now, um, this is the case if you knew the standard deviation of y was at most 1, you would run this algorithm. But if somebody told you, oh, the standard deviation of y is like at most 10, well, you just uh, divide y by 10 and then run the algorithm and then multiply your final mean estimate by 10 and that would multiply your error also by 10. So all of that I'm, all of that I'm saying is that um, if somebody gives you a bound, sigma sub bound, uh, on the standard deviation, you just divide by that bound, run the previous algorithm, and then multiply that by that bound. And you get that with order n you know, samples, I'll just say now, the time to run the code. Um, you estimate the mean, mu, to within plus or minus the standard deviation bound divided by n. And here's where we can really um, start comparing with uh, previous work and uh, previous classical algorithms. So this statement here was first proven by uh, Heinrich in 2001. Uh, you can compare with Montanaro's Monte Carlo paper from 2017. Um, except that they use slightly more samples at an extra polylog factor, uh, order n log n to the 1.5 log log n. Um, now let's compare this with the, the simplest of all classical algorithms for estimating the mean of some random variable, uh, where you just draw order n samples and take the empirical average. So Chebyshev's inequality uh, tells you that this algorithm will figure out the mean to within uh, the standard deviation, plus or minus the standard deviation, divided by square root n. So this quantum algorithm looks like the perfect quadratic improvement of that. Uh, and it's great, except there's one deficiency still with the quadratic, or the quantum algorithm, which is here, this um, classical algorithm, it works with the true standard deviation, and you don't have to tell the classical algorithm the standard deviation. In fact, the, the classical algorithm maybe never even knows the standard deviation, but nevertheless, just by outputting the empirical average of n samples, you're guaranteed to be within plus or minus the true standard deviation divided by square root n. And in the quantum version, you kind of need to know this bound, and you get only get the result in terms of the bound. So uh, we managed to eliminate that as well and get into the situation where the standard deviation is a priori unknown to the algorithm, but still we get a guarantee in terms of the standard deviation. So this is the final theorem that Robin and I prove. And you can just remember this uh, theorem if you like. Given randomized code or even quantum code that generates a random variable y uh, using quote unquote order n samples or amount of time equal to n times the amount of time to run this code for generating y, we can estimate the mean of y mu to within plus or minus um, sigma over n, where sigma is the true standard deviation of y, which the algorithm does not need to be told. And that's really good because it really makes it like a precisely the quadratic, exact quadratic speed up of the classical algorithm. And uh, achieving this from the earlier version requires some more tricks, in fact, some more quantum tricks. Uh, Mainly, we need this idea of Yassin Hamoudi uh, that he had in his PhD thesis. He introduced this quantile estimation algorithm, uh, which is kind of like quantum minimum finding. And uh, he was able to similarly convert the, the Montanaro result into one where you don't need to know the standard deviation uh, with the same sample complexity there. So Hamoudi achieved our result also with n times polylog n samples. OK, so that's the main thing I wanted to tell you about. Um, and you could ask yourself, you know, 
Uh, did we really, in the end, do much more than just, you know, shave some log factors off Hamoudi's algorithm? Uh, well, yes and no. So I, I would like to close by telling you two reasons why I think it's uh, uh, a nice result, even though it's merely eliminating some log factors. So the first one is that, as I said, it, it with once you get rid of these uh, log factors, you have the perfect quadratic speed up over classical. And that's nice because... Um, you know, our result here strictly subsumes all these things like Grover's algorithm, quantum counting, amplitude estimation, etc. Um, they all follow from this result. And in general, like most uh, quantum quadratic speedups that the average person uses are from this category. And so you can sort of just remember this one theorem uh, when you're trying to remember like what do quantum quadratic speedups uh, do or how do they work. Um, the other thing I like about it that's nice is that um, you see our central algorithm, you know, for distinguishing mean zero from mean epsilon or so, was this very simple Grover-like algorithm. And although it didn't, um, you know, fully solve the problem, we had to layer some extra stuff on top of it. Um, heuristically, you could use it, I think, to estimate the mean of a random variable without putting on all this additional stuff. And it's equally um, easy to implement as Grover. So I think heuristically in the future, if Grover is ever um, feasible to run, then our algorithm would be feasible to run too. And it would be a nice way to try to heuristically estimate the mean of a random variable. Okay, 